thanks for having me. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm Stephanie, and uh, like some of the other speakers have mentioned, I want to dispel the myth that I'm a senior ninja Rockstar developer. I've actually only been a dev for about three years. I uh, started out as a Ruby on Rails developer, and for the past year I switched and I wanted to do front-end JavaScript, so that's what I've been doing. Um, currently I work at a startup in Amsterdam called Verkspot, and I also organize the Stupid Hackathon in Amsterdam, and if you've never heard of a Stupid Hackathon, it's just a really, just like the name says, it's a stupid uh, day of coming up with the most ridiculous ideas for apps or hardware, and then when we build them, I organize it with uh, Ninka, she's in the audience here, so another developer in Amsterdam, and it's a lot of fun, we do it every year. Um, please, I would love for Cluj to steal this idea and to see a Stupid Hackathon Cluj. So, um, as you might already can tell, I really like to buy, uh, build fun things with LEDs, like um, my outfit, my umbrella. Um, I made a LED rainbow motion reactive collar for my dog, and even though he looks like he's quite bored by it, he actually loves it. If he goes out um, in the park, he gets nothing but comments about how, look at the cute little dog with a rainbow collar, um, and he just eats that up. Um, but I'm also a hardware newbie. I've only been messing around with hardware for about a year. And I only got into hardware because um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have like some great home automation idea or something. It was kind of by accident. Um, I went to an art museum and I got really inspired. So in Amsterdam, we have this great contemporary art museum called the Stedelijk. And I went there to see an, uh, specifically an exhibit by this artist um, called Jean Tingley. And Jean Tingley, he's a Swiss artist. Uh, most of his work's from the 60s and 70s. And for him, art was not about standing in a sterile white space and distantly gazing at a silent painting. Art was meant to be playful. Um, he created um, installations of all different sizes. Um, and these installations were meant to be triggered by a viewer. And the viewer's experience was integrated into overall effect of the work itself. So he took that into account when he was making them. And it was meant to intentionally blur this line between who's the artist and the viewer because you're bringing the viewer in to your art. Um, so uh, he created pieces like this. He created hundreds of pieces, but uh, like this. And um, like the viewer is invited to choose some kind of writing implement, like a pen, marker, um, crayon, place it in the holder, and then when they uh, press a button, trigger an emotion, it just moves that uh, writing implement along a piece of paper, and it creates an entirely new piece of art. Um, and so it's no longer just about watching a process, the viewer by choosing that draw drawing tool, plays a role in the creation of an entirely new work of art. And also when I was at this ex exhibit, I saw this quote by Sean Tingley, and it really stood out for me. It says, I wanted something ephemeral that would pass like a falling star. The work just had to transpire, make people dream and talk, and that would be all. And for me, I really, this really stuck out to me because I really liked this idea of art as this temporary experience that connects an artist and a viewer, connects two people, and it's spontaneous and it's only meant to bring joy for a really short amount of time. And it can be, and it also can be unique each time between the artist and the viewer. It can it, not necessarily the same experience each time. So I was really excited by all these ideas that, and the, his art that I saw at the exhibit. And I really wanted to figure out a way to use my skill set as a developer and somehow create my own interactive art experience. And unfortunately, unlike John Tingley, I didn't have a studio space to create a huge um, art installation. So I needed to come up uh, with something a bit more accessible. And for me, I uh, thought the most accessible, accessible form of expression would be my clothing. So I wanted to apply this idea of interactivity to my clothing. And I was really interested in the interactions that might occur when people realize that they have control over my clothing. And I didn't just want to, you know, haphazardly stick some LEDs on a t-shirt and go out with that and ha make an app. Um, I really wanted to make this complete, cohesive look. And uh, so you can see in this video, this is uh, 
uh, the final outfit that I made for, to go out and interact with people. So umbrella, necklace, and a skirt. Um, so I wanted this cohesive look, and it would be completely interactive um, through a web app. And so I came up with a project plan. So I was going to make a web app, and you can see a preview here. You can pick colors and a program. And then I needed, obviously, to make the clothes. So uh, I was going to integrate LEDs and, and microcontrollers into different pieces of clothing. And then I needed somewhere to get the information from the web app to my clothing. So coming from a web development background and not a hardware background, I immediately thought of one of my favorite libraries out there for communication, Socket.io. If you've never heard of it, check it out. It's amazing. It works on like every device and platform and um, browser. Um, so this was how I was going to handle that communication between the app and the clothing. It's uh, just event-based messaging library. And it just, like I said, it works in all browsers and devices. And my idea was just to integrate uh, the Socket.io client libraries into the web app and my clothing. And then to relay those messages, I would just need to uh, create a Socket.io server. And, it just and for that, I was just going to um, create just a Node.js server and um, just let that handle the messaging. So yeah, I had this plan. I it sounded like I really had everything thought out, that it was going to be really easy and go smoothly. But um, as you can probably guess by this slide, it didn't happen that way. I actually fa faced a lot of challenges. Um, for me, uh, being a hardware newbie, this was the most wiring and soldering I had ever done. It was just the most ambitious hardware project because I was um, just building so many pieces and working with like the most LEDs I've ever worked with. But uh, really, like uh, one main takeaway you can take away uh, from my talk is, you know, building stuff is all about iteration, not just with hardware, but with our software that we build at work or for fun. Um, you know, I had a lot of setbacks uh, that made me unsure of my ability, especially since I'm like a new coder, um, and I got frustrated a lot, and I was just thought I was going to be a terrible maker and never get better at any of this stuff. But I just tried to learn, and um, I really just tried to continually improve my project. So let's start at the beginning. So again, here's uh, the plan I had for my whole project. So create a simple web app, um, integrate that with a Socket.io client. Um, then I would have a Socket.io server in the middle that would relay messages from the app to my clothing. And then I would just use um, Arduinos in my clothing and um, integrate. A, they have a Socket.io client for Arduino as well um, and just integrate that. And uh, I would just throw everything on Heroku because I like Heroku. Who is easy, it's got a great CLI. And so my main focus was really just worrying about the hardware. And I needed to figure out how I was going to control all these LEDs. Um, so I needed to pick a microcontroller. And my requirements really, it needed, because it's going to be in clothing and on a necklace, it really needed to have a really small footprint. It needed to be durable since I would be taking on and off. And I wanted to, it to have Wi-Fi connectivity, so um, I wanted to just tether off my cell phone, so that's how I could um, get the messages. And I ended up choosing Arduino, and um, Arduino is just a really great choice for a project like this because if you um, are not familiar with Arduino versus like Raspberry Pi, Arduino is just kind of, um, if you just have a task, it just basically uh, sets up like in a loop that runs. And you, it's great because if you just have it like listening for something to happen, it can just like, it's just running this loop, and it can just listen and then go do things with your message after that. Um, I see someone already knows like my URL for my um, um, app, so that's great. Um, yeah, so this is a Feather Hizza. It's an Adreno. It's small. It has Wi-Fi built in, and uh, also it has a lot of tutorials and info online. So uh, that kind of reassured me. So building phase. Um, if you've never built with hardware, I can really recommend that you kind of try to think things out because this will save you a lot of grief. And using like a program like Fritzing um, and coming up with your wire wiring diagrams, because trust me, when you get in the middle of like a pile of wires and you don't have some kind of thing to uh, like a map to ground you, it can get really confusing. Um, so as you can see, I have strips of LEDs, I have a microcontroller, a switch, and a battery. And yeah, the build process, uh, it's not really that glamorous. It's me. Like I said, I'm from Amsterdam. 
and it's me just sitting on a fl on the, my floor of my, like a tiny apartment, hunched over, soldering, and then testing things, and then realizing you s solder things wrong, and then like retesting and doing things. So, but you know, I got through the process. And I was even so prepared that like before I even went out to test this, I created these cards. So I was trying to minimize like my uh, talking too much to uh, people when I interact with them, just kind of letting them have the surprise and just hand a card with the URL and then let them try to um, just check it out. So I was ready to take it out and show it to the world. And I took it out um, in December. We have this lighted bike ride in Amsterdam because in Amsterdam we love bikes. And um, it's perfect for me because I love LEDs and I love biking. So it's like two things I love. And I went out and um, I have a little video clip. And as you can see, that green light, that's not supposed to happen. Um, that's actually my uh, skirt. Uh, was crashed and rebooted, and uh, that was totally not supposed to happen, and the other programs are working, and I was really embarrassed by this. Like, people thought it was magical, and they didn't really notice these things so much, but I noticed all the times that my necklace, my umbrella, and my skirt were, like, crashing at different points, and, um, yeah, I was just really embarrassed and disappointed that it didn't work. I put all this work in, and then like to have your project not work really sucked. Um, so I just tried not to let it get me down, and I just uh, tried to use the opportunity to just uh, troubleshoot it and make it work better. So I obviously I needed to figure out where it was crashing and why it was crashing. And uh, with Arduino, you get an IDE, and um, what's cool is uh, with this particular microcontroller, you can plug in with USB and do like serial monitoring. Um, so I kind of did what I do sometimes as a JavaScript developer and just put a bunch of like console log statements. And then I could see that um, it was disconnecting and reconnecting. So it kept, um, the Wi-Fi was just not stable. It was just disconnecting and reconnecting. Something was going on there. So yeah, I had a flaky connection. And I started thinking about the tools I was using to um, relay the, the information between the app and the, the clothing. And um, yeah, like I said, I'm a huge Socket IO fan, and it's so great for the web. Um, but it's really made for web applications and communicating over HTTP, which I didn't really need that extra overhead. So I started thinking, like, really, is this maybe this is my problem? Like, is this really the best fit for my IoT project? And you know, I just took a step back, and just because a library is available in like the language or uh, whatever you're using, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best solution. So I took a step back, and I really thought about. You know, what you're up against when you're coding for hardware. You have these tiny microcontrollers, and your resources are just at a premium. Um, and I wasn't communicating between a browser. Um, so I really didn't need the extra overhead for HTTP. And I just really needed the bare minimum um, messaging library. So I started like uh, looking for that. And what I found is MQTT. And I love MQTT. It's a machine-to-machine -machine IoT connectivity protocol. And I was a little embarrassed to find out that it was in invented in 1999. So it's actually been around for a while. Um, and there's um, libraries based on it now that make it like really easy to, to implement. Um, and it was invented in 99 because uh, um, these developers were trying to find a solution for like mission critical uh, real time data from these remote pipelines. So they needed something that didn't like uh, that had minimal battery loss and then also minimal bandwidth connecting sensors over like really flaky satellite connections. Um, it's based on the publish subscribe architecture. So you have clients and you have a broker. So clients connect to the broker and that the broker uh, mediates the communication between devices. And when a device connects, it can subscribe to a topic. So then when another client publishes a, messages, a message on that topic, the broker forwards that message to any client that has subscribed to that topic. And what's really great is that uh, the publisher and the subscriber, they, they don't need to know about each other. They don't need to run at the same time. And operations on both devices are not halted during publishing or receiving. So it just can work kind of asynchronously. Um, it's also extremely lightweight. So the 
control packet headers are kept as small as possible. Every bit in that packet is carefully crafted to reduce the data transmitted over a network. And it means that in comparison to other protocols like HTTP, it uh, doesn't need to load the net network with transfer of information, which is only necessary for the functioning of the protocol. And so having this small header overhead makes this really appropriate for IoT. Um, because it just lowers the amount of data that might need to be tr transmitted over possibly constrained networks. It's also super flexible. They were very like forward thinking when they came up with this in 1999. So it's data agnostic. The payloads, you can send binary. You can send JPEG images from camera, remote cameras. You can send PDFs. It's really, you can send really whatever you want. Um, it's super reliable. You can hook it up to a database. Um, so you can have offline images, sofa clients on, offline. Messages can be stored in a database by the broker. And then when uh, the client reconnects, then uh, they're available again. It's also, re it's also reliable because you can have these different levels of a quality of service. So a quality of service is just agreement between sender and receiver of a message regarding the guarantee of that message getting delivered. So this is really a major feature of MQTT. It makes communication and unreliable networks a lot easier because the protocol just handles the retransmission and guarantees delivery of the message regardless of how unreliable the network is. So you can have anywhere from zero to two, and that just means um, with zero, you're just publishing, it's called um, fire and forget. You get no confirmation that any the clients that are subscribed actually receive your message. Um, and you can all go all the way up to a level two quality of service, where it actually does four trips between the broker and the client to make sure that the uh, client receives a message and they only receive exactly one copy of the message, so there's no duplicates there. And MQTT has a short and readable specification, and it uses simple verbs to describe actions. Um, basically, there's five verbs in MQTT, connect, disconnect, publish, subscribe, and ping. So I was pretty much sold. Let's like MQTT everything. Um, so I, since I had been using Socket.io, I needed to rework my app um, and the hardware and my server setup to use it. So at first I started with the web app client. And uh, there's a great library. It's just mqtt.js. Um, it's uh, written for uh, in JavaScript for Node.js applications and also being used in the browser. Um, it's really easy to follow. So it's only a couple of lines of code. And you basically just include the library. You create a client. And then that client, you just tell it where, where on the web it should connect to the broker. And then I can just create a function that whenever, like, I, if I have a button on the page called Rainbow Button that's supposed to change all the colors to rainbow, whenever uh, that button gets clicked, it just publishes a message under the topic lights, and it just sends um, the, the payload, which is just a string rainbow. And then next, I needed to set up my Adreno clients. Um, and even though this is like Adreno C++-ish code, um, I still think it's really easy to follow. So you basically just, it's the same steps, really. You include the library. Um, you uh, connect the client to the M um, MQTT broker again. You just tell it where it's at on the web. I subscribe it because I want this uh, client to actually receive um, messages whenever there's anything published live. So I just subscribe to the topic lights. And then whenever there's a message received for that topic, uh, then it just calls this on message um, method and then does something to make the lights um, change. So everything was going really smoothing. So I thought, yeah, of course, like setting up the MQTT broker will be really straightforward too. And, and it is, but I had a slight hiccup. I, since, if you remember, I said I was deployed on Heroku, and I adore Heroku. But uh, the simplicity of like setting things up with a Heroku also kind of limits you um, because they don't allow port access. So, and for the MQTT protocol, I really needed access to port 1883, and I couldn't get that on Heroku. And I, yeah, so, and I wasn't also, I wasn't ready to move my whole application. Yeah, even though it wasn't a big application, I just 
kind of lazy. I wasn't really ready to move until I had actually tried out MQTT to see if it's actually that awesome. Um, so I just started looking for external MQTT broker uh, services. And there's a lot. Adafruit has one. Um, but I found this one called Shifter.io. It's just really for prototyping. And I picked it because it's free and it's really easy setup. You just sign up with your email and you get a token and your um, broker, um, broker URL. And they also don't seem to limit the number of messages per minute. Some of the services, if you're doing a free plan, they do limit how many messages you can uh, send and receive per minute. So this had no, this was like unlimited. So this is what I went with. So this was kind of like what my uh, my plan looks like now. I just had like the web app, and then I had Shifter as my broker, and then it was just really re relaying everything to the Adreno. And it worked great, and I should have been like really happy again. But again, I'm kind of a perf perfectionist, and I wasn't really happy because there's a bit too many unknowns. I was relying on the small external broker service. Um, I didn't really know that much about it. There's not like a lot of info about them. Um, and so I didn't really know, like, does it go, is it gonna stay supported? You know, what about downtime? So you can probably guess what I did next. And I built my own MQTT broker. Um, so I needed that access to that port 1883. So I just ended up moving my application from Heroku to DigitalOcean, which um, for some, maybe not a big deal, but for me, I'm like, ugh, DevOps, I'm kind of scared of it. Um, but it really wasn't that bad, like configuring Nginx and everything wasn't that bad. Um, so yeah, this, was, this is actually what my final setup looks like. I just moved my, so my web app and my broker are just uh, running through an express server on DigitalOcean. And to implement the MQTT broker, there's, this is a, a, another great library called ADES. Um, it's just for implementing it in Node, the Node way. And what's, what I really liked about it is my broker is embeddable in my current Express server. So I could just like have my web app being served and then also have my MQTT broker all being served by the same Express app. So it's just like all neatly packed into one little application. Um, and to implement the MQTT broker, uh, it's just embarrassingly so few lines of code. It's, it's amazing. So you just include the library. You, I created it because I was uh, um, running my app through the server. So I create an MQTT server for those MQTT connections from the Adreno. Then I also create an HTTP server um, for serving the, the website. And then I just specify the ports to use. And then it listens on those ports. And then um, at the bottom, you can see you can add on so that the HTTP server can handle, can have MQTT over WebSockets capabilities. So those MQTT um, um, messages coming in from the web app, those are just handled over uh, WebSockets through the HTTP server, which is I think is really, really cool. Um, yeah, so it was awesome. And I was finally like, really super happy that it worked. Um, so yeah, I was done. No, I wasn't done. <laughs> um, I wanted to make this like really rock solid, so I decided to upgrade the microcontroller. Um, I switched to this Adafruit Feather M0 with Wi-Fi. And the reason I really switched is it has low power management. So it makes it more efficiently, and it can run my, um, just utilize my battery more efficiently. But also, it has a separate Wi-Fi module. So um, with the Feather HISA, um, they were um, on like the same, um, um, in the same core, but uh, with this, it doesn't have to yield the Wi-Fi core because it's, it's in a separate chip. So you get like full reign of processor and timing, and it's just like really rock solid. The only downside is, oh, it, you get high-speed reliable <laughs> Wi-Fi. Um, the only downside is it's about twice the cost of the first one I was using. So the first one, the Feather Hizza, is about 18 euros, and this one's 35 euros. Um, so what's next? I do have plans to make this even better. So the Feather M0 has a full Python interpreter on board. So I really want to rewrite that uh, Adreno C++ code in CircuitPython because I feel like such a hack in um, Adreno and I feel more comfortable writing it in Python and it would be a lot more readable. Um, so yeah, 
It's demo time. So some people already know the URL, but please feel free to visit flashylights.nl, and you can interact. Uh, keep in mind that this is meant to be more like a one-on-one -on -one experience um, than like being bombarded uh, with uh, lots of uh, messages from people. But uh, yeah, feel free to check it out. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to go over some of my final thoughts. So in this project, I messed up a lot. And it takes a, a lot of iterations to sometimes get something right. Um, I did sloppy soldering. Like I w pulled out a, my hair because of like dealing with DevOps sometimes. And it was super frustrating. But in the end, I think I got better. And, but at least maybe I just maybe learned from making the same mistake twice or that I didn't make it a third time. Um, and this is actually a really weird experiment to do as an introvert. I am an introvert, and attracting attention and actively seeking out people to interact with me is way outside of my comfort zone. But I was just really interested to see if I could like make this, what I set out to do was make this momentary joyful experience with strangers by just letting them, um, giving them the joy of interacting with my clothing and changing the lights. Um, and it's just really an application like this is just not something, uh, not a side attack that a lot of folks have experienced. Um, so I wanted to try to uh, try that. And it was also an experiment that kind of pushed me to deal with my own reactions to people coming up to me and interacting. And it really, it, for me, it questioned like it brought up a lot of questions about who and what belongs in tech because a lot of times when you just go out walking around Amsterdam with this, people come up and they instantly ask you, "Where, where can I buy this?" And then when you tell them, "I didn't buy this, I made this," uh, they really aren't expecting that answer, especially coming from a, a woman. Um, so it was really cool to kind of break those stereotypes with strangers, and then also just to show them this kind of more useless but beautiful side of tech that tech doesn't, doesn't have to just be a new app on your phone. Um, it can just be something creative and just a form of expression. So thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I would prefer just to, um, to find me one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you.